All right. Welcome to the 25th Virtual History of 2021, presented by Baltimore Architecture Foundation and Baltimore Heritage. My name is Nathan Dennis, Associate Director of the Baltimore Architecture Foundation. Thank you to everyone who donated to be with us today. Your support allows us to host these virtual histories every week. And before we get started, a few announcements. We are off next week and will return on July 30th for a virtual tour of the Church of the Redeemer. For those of you who participated in our Architecture Madness Tournament this spring, you might remember that the church made it to the semifinals uh, and eventually uh, lost to uh, the American Vision Art Museum, which, which won the tournament. And uh, today we have Meg Fielding returning uh, with one of her ever fascinating architectural adventures. Today, she will be taking us around to Baltimore's municipal buildings from pumping stations to city hall. This October, you might be able to see some of these buildings in person for Doors Open Baltimore. Meg is a past president of Baltimore Architecture Foundation and loves to explore Baltimore and the surrounding areas. By day, she is the head of the history of Maryland Medicine at MedKai, which was founded in 1799. But on weekends, you might find her on a lonely road on the Eastern shore searching for a small ancient church. Follow her on Instagram at Pigtown Design. Meg is also uh, our first presenter to, to uh, present back-to-back -back presentations. So go Meg. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> and if you have any questions during the presentation, please add them to the Q&A box. And with that, take it away, Meg. Okay. Um. Hello, everybody. Um, I am going to talk to you today about municipal architecture. And it used to be that um, municipal architecture is made up of grand edifices to show you that government work is serious business. But there are so many buildings that are encompassed by the general label that they include mundane ones like waterworks, libraries, jails, and firehouses. And there was a pride in making these buildings as beautiful as possible. The heyday of this building campaign was between the late 1800s and the 1920s. But there are some that I'm going to show you that are earlier and some that are later. And as in some of my other lectures, I've included the charming watercolors done by my, my friend and fellow Baltimore Architecture Foundation board member, Jerome Gray. So we are going to start with waterworks, including towers, tanks, and pumping stations. And initially, I thought there were just a few of these waterworks around the city. I'm most familiar with the Roland Water Tower because I live there. But as I searched some more, I discovered that these buildings are everywhere. And as a group, they seem to be more beautiful than any of the other buildings. And we're gonna start with my favorite. This is the Vernon Pumping Station. And you may have seen the top of this as you're driving up 83, the Jones Falls Expressway, right by 28th Street. You can just see the tip of it peeking over the Jersey barriers. It's part of the interconnected Druid Hill, Jones Falls and Ashburton water system. And three huge pumps distribute more than a million gallons of water a day to area residents. If you look at the Baltimore Architecture Foundation's YouTube channel, you can see an interior tour we did earlier this year. And you can see that there is just a ton of detail on this building. You can see the little um, polychrome terracotta, glazed terracotta here. You can see the lozenge with the date here. You can see all the decoration around the door, you know, the roped columns. Um, this is an early picture of it. Um, but it's just such a fascinating building. So it was built in 1931. Um, the style is Italian Renaissance Revival. And the architect is Frank Heider. And we'll come across his name a couple more times as we go through this. This is another one of my favorites. It's the Curtis Bay water tank, circa 1937. And again, the architect is Frank Heider. It's in Kerr's Bay, Brooklyn Park area. And you can actually see it from um, Fells Point and, the, um, and Canton, if you look straight across um, the middle branch. Um, Hyder drew up plans in 30, 1932 
for brick facade for an existing black steel water tank. The two foot thick shell was constructed out of hand picked bricks in 28 shades, um, as you can see, going from the top to the bottom and then the bottom to the top. Um, there are 24 pillars and 24 panels in this. The detail on the top course of bricks is just really amazing. And this was probably one of the um, WPA pro projects in Baltimore. And there's a very similar tank to this in Catonsville on Melvin Avenue, but it has much more of an art deco look to it. This is the Montebello water treatment plant started in about 1880. It's mission style with Italianate features. The architects, there were a number of them over the years, um, possibly James Armstrong. And the reservoir um, is mostly on the east side of Hill and Road with some smaller buildings like this one and this one. And then on the west side of Hill and Road, there are larger buildings like these. This was built, um, this round building was built in, I think the 1920s, but then it was demolished in the 1960s because from the minute they built it, it never actually worked the way it was supposed to. It had leaks and there were a lot of problems. So it was demolished. But um, I look at this building and I think this would just make the best residence. Um, I would have my bedroom up here and then do all my entertaining down here. But if you go over there, they're just, you know, that you have to look around because they're in three different places, but I think they're just great, great buildings. So, um, you know, just one of my, another one of my favorites. This is the Roland Water Tower, circa 1904, Italian Renaissance Revival, and the architect was William Fazzoni. Um, a lot of people call this the Roland Park Water Tower. It's not, it's the Roland Water Tower. It, it was a 211,000 gallon water tank used to supply water to residents of Hamden and Roland Park. And again, it's sort of this complicated water system that's the Vernon water station, um, a Druid water station, and um, somehow um, with the water supplied by Lake Roland. The tower design is by William Fazzoni, who worked um, as the architect of the city water department between 1900 and 1912. And it's similar to one that's over on the west side called the West Arlington Tower. And the picture on the left was taken before um, the work began um, over the past year. And Suzanne Frazier, who's FAIA, who is a member of um, the AIA in Baltimore, and also I think um, Center, I mean, the. Um, Bottom Architecture Foundation really led the charge to have this building um, renovated and restored and they did a beautiful job. The fencing is all down, the scaffolding is down, and um, the peregrine falcons who live there are back, which is just a wonderful thing. This is the Eastern High Service Pumping Station and it's over sort of off of Gay Street it's um, circa 1888 or 1890, as you can see. Romanesque, um, the architecture was Jackson Gotten. It's not in Roland Park. I must have used another slide. Um, but it's, um, was, the buildings were used to house a machinery department and a high service water pumping station that actually worked a lot on the east side of the city. Um, it was in disrepair, as you can see here over the last number of years. And it's just started being revitalized for um, the East Baltimore Food Hub. And I think the Baltimore Architecture Foundation had our last Groundhog Day party in February of 2020 um, in this, right before everything shut down. Um, the buildings were used as Cuddy's Gym, if you remember that in the wire. Um, and there's just amazing brickwork. You can see here, it's sort of this lattice work, um, you know, some of the decoration on it. It's really quite lovely. And, you know, it's a fairly big compound. And um, I know the work on it has stopped for the last year because of everything that's been going on, but hopefully they'll um, get started on it again. 
And these are some of the other um, pumping stations around the city. Um, this is Guilford Pumping Station, uh, another really pretty one. Unfortunately, they've just taken off the terracotta roof and replaced it with really trashy looking uh, asbestos tiles, uh, which is very unfortunate. This is the Lake Roland pumping station. And Lake Roland is actually responsible for a lot of the water that comes into the city, along with the other reservoirs. This is the Eastern Avenue one that everybody knows really well. Um, there's a public service museum there. There's actually also another Eastern Avenue pumping station over in Highland Town. And this is uh, the, this one here is the um, high service water pumping station at Druid Hill. And it's actually one of three water pumping stations that are on that property. And if you're old like me, you might remember this as the reptile house at the zoo. Um, I, I think I went there once and then just refused to ever go back again because I don't like reptiles. So the next up is the neighborhood libraries. And in the late 18th and early, late 19th and early 20th centuries, the libraries in Baltimore were constructed with funding from Andrew Carnegie as well as Enoch Pratt, um, who generously provided in a lot of the early funding. And the branch libraries played an essential role in expanding the library's influence throughout the city and enabled the, the libraries to reach new populations by bringing the libraries into developing neighborhoods. And the libraries started with four, um, and they're all still in existence. Um, these were designed by the firm of Simonson and Page, and were um, they display the characteristics of this number one right here, um, sort of, you know, these peaked roofs, these, um, you know, just detail around the chimneys. Um, you can see they're all very, um, very similar. Um, they each had about four thousand books in them. Um, and they were um, the Romanesque style with high peaked tipped roofs, three cross gables and slate roofs, the great little eyebrow windows you can see here. Um, unfortunately, this one's mostly been covered up and um, stone finials cap the gables. And then each of the chimneys has brick molded terracotta details, which you can just sort of see here, not on this one. Um, this one, which has actually been covered by form stone, um, you can still see the detail on the, um, the chimney. Um, so some of these are still libraries, others are not. The other one that you might know in this series is the um, one in Charles Village on St. Paul's, which is the village learning place now. And the architect was Charles Carson. Um, this is sort of the second wave of the, um, the building that they did. Um, this is sort of a classical revival style. They were mainly designed by Archer and Allen. They had a rectangular footprint with an L in the back. Um, and they were all sort of stretcher bond brick buildings, sort of ashlar cut um, bases and sort of a, a regular stone um, foundation. This is in Locust Point and I lived there for a long time and I would see this building and always just think, what in the world was that? Why is this building here? And why is it used as um, storage or for a trucking company now? And I just recently found out that it was one of the early branches of the library. This one, you may have seen it's on Central Avenue. It's been converted into a house. Um, you can actually find pictures of it online. Um, it was recently sold a couple of years ago. This is interesting. I actually lived around the corner from this one and um, it's now been converted into a church. And I always thought this is not a very church looking building. So it was interesting to find out that it was actually one of the libraries. And um, this is on Linwood and Fayette. And I think this one is still in operation. None of the other three of these are. This is one of my favorite ones. It's designed by um, Ellick and Emmert and they actually designed um, my office building, which is the old school, public school 49. And there's just so much detail in this. If you look along the roof lines, look at the, you know, interesting brickwork. Um, 
And this was built with funds from the Carnegie Library Fund, and then it was um, donated back to the city um, for the Forest Park branch. And this is um, Jerome's picture of it. But again, you can see all of this detail in it. And it's just really, you know, very sweet building, very active. They have a lot of programs, um, obviously not over the last year, but um, I just think it's one of the really good looking ones. And we actually found some, one of the, the plans for it in um, one of the early Brick Builder magazines. This is the third wave of the um, libraries that they did. Um, they, none of these are actually libraries anymore, which is a shame. This is a church, not really sure what this is, but they're all, you know, a, a very similar look. Um, so the central pediment hit proof, projecting entrance bay, um, so the limestone decorative door surround. Um, this, um, this style was generally designed by J. Appleton Wilson and J. J. Appleton Wilson and Wilson Smith. Um, so, you know, when you see this sort of variety around, um, you'll actually know now that they're libraries. Um, I actually saw this one a couple of weeks ago as I was looking for something else. And I was like, oh my God, what is that? And I like whipped into the street and took a right hand turn right into the street and then realized it was a one-way street going the other way. So um, did manage to get some pictures of it though. And these are sort of the early 20th century ones. The um, Hamilton and Govins are the work of architect um, Theodore Peitch and are so the, the style that they were using then, and it's also similar to the Roland Park branch, which was by Buckler and Fenhagen. And in this one, the Roland Park branch is a little bit of an outlier because it's stone and not brick. And then there's this teeny tiny little branch. It's in Westport on Annapolis Road. And I'd always been very curious about this building as well. Um, and didn't think that it was originally a church, but just recently found out that, um, it was branch number 27 library. And then firehouses, engine companies and car barns. Um, we are really lucky to have a lot of interesting firehouses here. And part of that is because of the Great Baltimore Fire in 1904. And so after that fire, um, fire engine, firehouses had sort of an increased importance here in Baltimore. Um, so in, and also some of the car barns and the companies um, in the late 1800s and early 1900s, um, the city had private rail lines before they had sort of a bus service and it was a precursor to today's light rail system. So all of these private um, rail lines needed a place to store their cars. So you'll see a number of car barns around the city, but we'll look at the firehouses first. This number one firehouse on Paca Street is one of the first ones that they built. Um, it was designed in about the, in the late 1800s and it was designed again by Simonson and Peitch. And the characteristics of this and a lot of other of the same era fire houses were this rectangular, rectangular plan, as you can see, um, one or two, bay facades. Um, this is a one, this is two, this is slightly more unusual. This is a number one, this is Calvert Street. Um, Two-story height and then a rear um, hose drying tower. And that's actually one of the ways you can tell something was a firehouse. Um, if you're sort of scanning and you think there might be one close by, they usually have this high tower here because they would pulley the hoses up to the top and let them hang down several stories so they could dry out. So it's a real characteristic. And if you ever suspect something might be a firehouse, that's, that's one of the key things to look for. This is one of the really sort of amazing fire stations that we have here in the city. It's the Poppleton Fire Station. It's a Tudor Revival style building directly derived from prototypes as the entrance to the clock fort at Hamden Court Palace and the gateways to St. John's College in Cambridge, England. 
The facade is brick and limestone composition featuring a central Tudor archway, um, octagonal towers, and crowned with a crenellation. And, you know, this is, I just think this is so interesting. Um, the building unfortunately had a fire several years ago. As you can see, the windows are sort of still blocked up. This is a recent picture. Um, not sure how long ago this was, but um, the, the windows are still blocked up. You could see that in the um, fire hose tower, um, there was a lot of destruction on that. Um, it's been used as apartments. I'm not really sure if it's being used now, um, but it um, is just such an interesting building and it's um, Owens and Cisco were the um, architects for it and it was um, engine number 38. So this is sort of the car barns. Um, you may have seen this one. It's sort of Caddy Corner to Druid Hill Park. Um, it's United w Railways Park Terminal, um, 1910 Renaissance Revival with the crenellations, as you can see. Um, Francis Baldwin was the architect. Um, it's, it was designed um, sort of in a modern corporate style for this um, company. And it's sort of, as I said, Renaissance Revival. Um, it's on the corner of Fulton and Druid Hill. And the large bays were originally um, open for the streetcars to pass through so they could pick up and drop off um, the patrons. And you can see right here, this is where they would go through and come out the other side. And this was originally a big cast iron awning that was in front of it. Unfortunately, that's gone now. Um, and it's open by, I mean, it's owned by the, sort of the um, city general services now. And um, hopefully they're taking good care of it, but somehow I don't think so. And again, Jerome's nice pictures of this. This is the Carroll Park shops of the United Railway and Electric Company, which is now the MTA. Um, circa 1903, Classical Revival, Baldwin and Pennington, and um, we'll talk about Pennington in a few minutes. Um, it was, they consolidated most of the independent streetcar companies and provided sort of uniform services and rates because prior to this, um, there were a number of these streetcars and streetcar companies and, um, they, you know, each of them charged something different. So it was a big consolidation. So they built this Carroll Park shops to service and manage the large street of fleet cars. And in spite of their elegant barn-like appearance, the shops were models of up-to-date engineering efficiency. And when buses replaced street cars, the transfer table and the tracks were removed, but the shops themselves were easily adapted to the bus repair because of the flexibility which had been built into them in 1905. Three, and um, this is down sort of um, right across from Carroll Park, and um, I think they're just incredibly attractive buildings for what they are. They've got these see these buttresses along the edges, you know, these beautiful windows. Um, just you know, I, I for something so pedestrian, I, I think they they really put a lot of work into them. These you know nice huge windows, you know, to get light into the building. Um, Several of the other carbines and railway company buildings still remain. This was the um, Baltimore City Passenger, Rail, Passenger Railway. You can actually see this still. It's, I think, on Druid Hill. This is the um, powerhouse and carbine, which is now the Charles Theater. Um, again, this is, you know, where they would have, the carbs would have gone into and, and the carbines would have been stored. And then this one is on, um, this is on Druid Hill Avenue and this is on Central Avenue. I think there are plans to um, revitalize this building because the real estate on um, Central Avenue is becoming more and more valuable. So don't be surprised if you see some work going on there um, sooner rather than later. So next up is park buildings. And there are two large urban parks in Baltimore, Druid Hill Park and Patterson Park. There's also Leakin Park, but opposed to the other two parks, Leakin um, is much more naturally laid out. It's, um, you know, it's forested and wooded and, you know, with streams and rivers going through it. Whereas the other two are much more landscaped and um, very deliberate in their layout. So 
I'm just gonna, I, I've added a bunch of buildings to this because um, of our time limitations. So this is the Council Grove station. There used to be several railways that went through, um, went through and through Druid Hill Park. So um, the, that this was uh, originally one of the stations as was this. Um, it was designed a lot, this and a lot of the other buildings at Druid Hill were designed by George Frederick, um, who is also, we, I think we've talked about him before, but we'll talk about him once we get to the city hall. Um, this functions now as sort of the entrance to the park. Um, the Chinese pavilion, I'm putting Chinese in quotes, um, was moved to its present location, um, sort of from further in the interior of the park um, a number of years ago and was renamed La Trobe's Pavilion after the um, Druid Park Commission's original chairman, um, John Latrobe. And then other of the structures include this Lake Pavilion, which is very hidden away. You can't access it. Um, it's, you know, behind a gate, but you can see it from one of the park roads. And um, actually I actually went to a wedding there a couple of years ago and it was just magical. It's just really a beautiful little place. And unfortunately, as I said, you can't access it. And then these are um, picnic pavilions. And there's also, um, a dedicated pavilion for um, chess and checkers, which I think is great. Um, so this is the Druid Hill Park Gateway, so circa 1864, Tuscan Dark, again, George Frederick and John Latrobe. Um, it's at the entrance to Druid Hill Park, sort of on the Madison Avenue side. And um, the gateway was, um, Sort of collaborated between the park commission and the park architect. It was um, said to be re reminiscent of the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin. It has the two original carriageways you can see here, wide enough, 15 feet each, which were um, separated by columns. And then on either side, this is for more um, pedestrian access. On um, there's a sort of Doric frieze up here um, and it says Druid Hill Park inaugurated 1860, Thomas Swan mayor. And, um, you know, I think in the, the early days, this would have just been, you can see that it really would have been like a splendid way to just, you know, go through these gates and enter into the park. Now, um, Druid Hill Park Drive or Druid Park Lake Drive um, separates it from the park and, you know, there's a lot of parking and it just has really lost a lot of, you know, it's original just splendor and oomph and, um, you know, you don't see it as well. This is um, another pumping station um, that was originally the Western pumping station. Then it was sort of taken over by the um, reptile house that we saw earlier. Um, it was um, converted to a field and a bathhouse for the playing fields in the pool by Josias and Pleasance Pennington, um, who are another one of my favorite architects. It featured boiler rooms, laundries, drying rooms, a check-in room, showers, and more than 3,000 lockers. And the Tuscan column facade was added to give the building some dignity. And water from the pool that is just um, to the right Eight of this, if you're looking at it head on, which still is there today, originally um, was pipe, piped down from um, Lake Roland. And this is the Rawlings, Rawlings Conservatory, which I'm sure everybody has seen. Um, the Park Commission sent um, George Frederick to Washington to study the conservatories that were down there at the um, U.S. Botanical Gardens. Um, and his plan for the conservatory consisted of a central pavilion, which you can see here, and two wings. And the wings that he originally had planned were much more extensive than this. But the way he had designed it was that it could be built in stages and it's cast iron and glass and it's, you know, sort of high Victorian look. And it's also known or was known before um, recently, it was known as the Palm House. And as you can see, just in the top here, you can see the tops of the palm trees. Um, and there's just nothing better than going to the conservatory on a really cold, miserable, snowy day like this one. Um, so, so this was the part that the only part that was built. There are a number of greenhouses off to the sides here and in behind it, but this was the original part. And now we move over across the city to Patterson Park. 
um, the observatory and the casino. Um, Charles Latrobe, who designed this, was originally a bridge builder. So it's not surprising that the observatory's structure is cast iron um, and is resting on a granite base. It features a series of primarily arched window openings, but each floor is slightly different and has a def def different decorative window treatment. The upper three stories feature balconies with protective railings supported by brackets. And this is very similar to one in um, Kew Gardens, um, just outside of London. And it's also based on a tower in Nanking, China. Um, and then this building is the casino, which is sort of one of the lesser known buildings there. And I think it's used for um, you know, neighborhood functions and, and probably events. Um, it was built around the same time as the observatory and it was intended to rival Druid Hill's mansion house in prominence and picked up on its, the mansion house's primary feature was the big wraparound porch. There's a, it's two stories plus a basement. It's ashlar stone structure and an articulated rustic style. And there is another casino here still in Baltimore. It's up at um, Shepherd Pratt Hospital. Um, and it used to have this really beautiful um, view out over the valley, but it's now been surrounded by all of the dormitories at Towson University. But um, Shepherd Pratt, actually the campus is open to the public. So if you go in there and sort of poke around a little bit, you can see the building. Um, it's, it's not very similar to this in the structure, but it's just a, another great looking building. The next thing is um, public schools. In the early 1900s, um, it was the boon years for building extraordinary schools in Baltimore. There were architectural com competitions to design the largest school and in schools, including City College. Most adhered to the collegiate Gothic style of buildings, but occasionally there were outliers. And for a look at uh, many of the school buildings, um, if you look at the Baltimore Architecture Foundation's YouTube page, um, YouTube channel, there's a virtual lecture and tour on Baltimore's historic schools, which I did um, several months ago. This is my favorite of the schools. It's the Louisa May Alcott School, circa 1910, uh, Georgian Revival with bands of brick and stucco, and the architects again were Peitch and Simon Simpson. Um, the thing about this school is this is the view you get from Reisterstown Road. And you really don't see the mass of the school and just the sheer, you know, just volume of it, um, just how interesting it is. Um, you don't get the full grandeur of it just from the side. So you really do need to drive around it. There's a big parking lot um, on one of the sides and you can get a really good idea of how interesting the school is, how beautifully it's built and um, really, you know, get the full glory of it. And, um, in another one of the lectures I did, somebody asked me why it was named for Louise May Alcott. And um, at that point in time, they were naming the schools after sort of literary figures, um, you know, historic figures. There's an Edgar Allan Poe school that's down by the University of Maryland downtown. Um, the, one of the buildings that we own is, um, was the former school 49 by Ellick and Emmert, and that was named Robert E. Lee. Um, so a lot of these schools were named after, there's a top, well, actually the next, slide we'll see is Thomas Jefferson School. So they're named after luminaries um, and there didn't seem to be really any rhyme or reason to how they named them. Um, this is actually on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, it is now a um, senior living center and I think that it would be just wonderful to have these huge windows and you know lots of light and the, the building. So um, go over and take a look at it. It's on Reisterstown Road um maybe a mile or two south of uh cold spring lane and this is the thomas jefferson school it's a, a renaissance revival sort of front block designed by william gordon beecher um built in 1925 um sort of segmental arch window bays um so a lot of interesting detail on it um it's a fringe of this brick corbeling here. 
um, blind arcades, but the most significant feature is this huge copper cupola on top of it um, that's sort of lattice work. And it was originally used for ventilating the building um, on hot summer days because um, then as now there was no air conditioning in most of the city schools. And it's over in 10 Hills, um, sort of West Baltimore. I remember leaving after taking pictures of it and taking a wrong turn and ending up in um, Leakin Park, sort of um, Winds Falls, that whole area, and just really didn't have any idea how I got there. And this is one of Baltimore's most well-known schools, Baltimore City College, circa 1928. This is this, you know, traditional collegiate Gothic. Uh, the architects were Reagan Butler and George Fenhagen. It's over near Waverly. Um, after several moves, this iteration of City College was built, and it's known as the Castle on the Hill with an asymmetrical 150 foot clock tower, which is here. Um, it's perched on a hill overlooking Baltimore and the view is actually pretty nice. The exterior is mainly unchanged from when it was built. Um, and it was actually built by, I mean, the architects were Buckler and Fenhagen. And this was after um, an architectural competition that attracted architects from all over the country. And of course, you know, hometown boys won, which was great. Um, there are lots of little um, figures in the architecture. There are animals and birds. And this is Butler and Fenhagen built into the facade of the building, the little owl for learning and knowledge, the little monkey, I'm not sure why he's there, but he's got a book. Um, and it, it was just, there were 18 firms that had actually competed for designing this, but um, it's still just a really magnificent building. I've been inside once or twice and it's, you know, not, not really super special inside, but it is, it's just, you know, great building. And this is um, Roland Park Elementary and Middle School. Um, so 25 years after Roland Park was founded, uh, it was decided that it actually needed its own school. So Palmer and Lambden, who are my, my sort of go-to architects, um, um, designed this. Um, and they had also designed many of the houses, or Palmer designed many of the houses in Roland Park. But the Italianate style of this is very different from the houses in the neighborhood, making the buildings sort of stand out, you know, on the small rise where it was built. And it's just, you know, there's not, there's maybe one or two Italianate houses in the neighborhood. Um, but they added, um, two years after this was built, the building needed to be enlarged because they'd run out of room. And the addition, which is over here, um, took the capacity from um, 800 to 1200 students. And I think there's been some expansion. And um, a couple of years ago, there was a big fight about the um, roof tiles because they were falling off. And so the city was gonna replace them with um, just crappy roof tiles like they did with the Guilford pumping station. And there was a sort of somebody tried to put these on, didn't know how to do it. And anyway, there's a big lawsuit about it. And um, finally they did, actually went out and say you know, this is a stark building it needs to reflect that and you need to put these um sort of spanish tiles on the terracotta tiles and they will last another almost 100 years but you can see in this picture where you know the addition has gone on so sort of from this to this and i know jenny clark is on this talk and she can tell you all about what happened at roland park school um so the next thing is official and judicial buildings. Um, as I said at the very beginning, the business of government governing is a serious business and these buildings really needed to reflect that importance. Often the top architects of the time were engaged to design these buildings and no expense was uh, spared to make them beautiful. If anybody's uh, had jury duty at um, Mitchell Courthouse, they can attest to the fact that it's just crammed full of just gorgeous pieces and interesting architecture and details. So this is City Hall, which I'm sure most of you have seen at some point or another. Um, it was designed by George Frederick, who is was the architect um, for a lot of Druid Hill um, and the buildings there. It's um, in the French Renaissance style of the Second Empire, capped by a dome. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about the dome, um, 
we have a great video of a tour of the dome um, by um, the city architect and we did it um, probably last fall, but it's fascinating. Um, he showed us that all of these windows still open. They're all, um, you know, balanced and, you know, he basically flipped them up. Um, but um, so take a look at it, it's on our YouTube channel. Um, the building is constructed um, from Baltimore County marble, probably from Beaver Dam Quarry and Falls Road Bluestone. Um, remarkably, the building was designed to be fireproof and um, it was the first municipal building to do that in the nation. And that sort of um, tended, turned out to be a very fortuitous thing that they did because in 1904 when the fire came through, um, this is one of the few buildings that was left standing. And one of the really interesting things is um, George Frederick was 22 years old when he designed this building. And I don't know what you were doing when you were 22, but I was not designing city halls for major cities and buildings like this. I was just not. Um, this is uh, another building standing right across green from City Hall, it's the War Memorial Building. And um, both the city and state governments have always shared the expense of this building, which was designed in 1921 by um, Lawrence Hall Fowler to remember the dead from World War I, which had just ended several years, years earlier. And over the years, it's been used for various military and non-military functions. And if you remember, um, President Obama stopped here to give a speech on the way to his first inauguration in Washington, DC. And um, the Architecture Foundation had an event in here um, a couple of years ago. And it was, I think the first time I'd ever been in this building after seeing it for decades. And uh, it's quite interesting inside. And they've just done a lot of renovations on it. And I think opened up some of the windows on the side, but this sort of seahorsey horsey thing with the eagle taking care of the eagle. Um, there are two of these on either side, sort of right out of the picture. Um, and Jerome's beautiful little watercolor of that. And then, as I said, if you've ever done jury duty, oops, there's supposed to be a picture there. Um, if you've ever done jury duty, you've been in the Mitchell Courthouse. Um, this again was uh, as a result of a national architectural competition with the winner being the local firm Wyatt and Nolting. Um, just this elaborate cornice um, with consoles, dentals, egg and dart, lion's heads, balustrade, um, that all decorates the exterior of the building. This is actually a huge porch here, which you really don't realize. Um, you need to be across the street um, to really see, see this right here. Um, the interior of the building features significant spaces with marble walls, columns, mahogany woodwork, murals, barrel vaulted ceilings, mosaic floor tiles, and much more. And it was really designed um, to sort of outshine City Hall, but I think City Hall still wins. But you could just see this is um, actually popped up on my Facebook memories today um, from two years ago when I guess I was doing jury duty at uh, the Mitchell Courthouse. I don't think you're supposed to take pictures in there, so don't do not do what I say. Um, this is the US Customs House. Um, and it's just really a gorgeous, gorgeous building that you don't really notice because you're driving by on Gay Street really fast. Uh, it was built from 1903 through 1907 from plans by Hornblower and Marshall, which is a Washington DC firm. And Hornblower had uh, studied at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris in 1871 and actually brought back some of his ideas um, and used them in this building and a lot of buildings in Washington. Um, the exterior is ornamented by sea monsters, uh, which you can see right here, a little sea monster, um, seashells and grotesque masks carved in the granite um, with just, you know, you really need a lot of skill to be able to do that. Um, the building includes um, um, an in interior room, which you can see right here. It really doesn't seem to hold a lot of purpose. Um, you can see it here as well. And what you can barely see from this, and it has been impossible to find interior pictures. Um, and the only reason I know 
what this mural is, is because a friend of mine actually worked on helping restore them. And they're sailboats sailing into the Baltimore Harbor. And this mural is massive. And then around the edges, there are paintings, a series of paintings featuring 155 sailing vessels. And it's sort of, you know, really talking, of, you know, to the fact that Baltimore is a big port city and how much came in here. But, um, and this is, this is this part and this part right here. And then out front there are these really beautiful um, lands, lamp, lanterns. Um, and interesting, um, yeah, I think Phil, Phil said, yeah, no, the call room, and that's what it was called. But there are sort of these mercuries. And then um, for some reason, there's a, um, the caduceus, which is usually indicative of a medical society. And this is the base of the lamp, which is sort of stars and stripes. Um, but just, you know, a really pretty building, but it apparently um, impossible to get into, um, especially after 9-11. And then finally, we have another one of my favorites, the um, Baltimore City Jail, uh, completed in about 1859, Tudor Gothic inspired, Thomas and James Dixon, sort of Jonestown, East Baltimore. Um, um, it sort of served as the jail, the gatehouse the offices, the warden's residence, um, which was this little building. Um, sort of completed the adjacent, this big new part, or new-ish part, um, was, was intended to complement the adjacent Baltimore City Jail, also designed by the Dixons. And um, it incorporates Gothic and Tudor elements and constructed of Patapsco granite ashlar um, and local bluestone with trim of limestone that was most likely obtained from um, Baltimore County. And as you can see, just on the edge of this picture, they're actually in the middle of tearing it down, which I think is just um, a real shame because, uh, you know, I know it's not in a great neighborhood and it's right next to the jail, but it just seems to me that there were other alternatives of things to do um, rather than tear this building down. So, um, so that sort of concludes the interesting portion. Um, just wanted to talk about really quick some of the um, resources I resources that I used for the presentation. Um, Medusa, which is the Maryland State Cultural Resource System, it is a treasure trove of information. A little hard to navigate, but once you get in and really figure it out, it's just just the things you can find on are on it are amazing. Um, the Chap of Commission for Har Historical and Architectural Preservation. Baltimore Architecture Foundation's Dead Architect Society. Um, we each number of us have picked different architects um, from the early 1900s to do a deep dive on. Mine are Palmer and Lambden, and if you want information, you can go to palmerandlambden.com. Uh, Facebook, um, Old Baltimore Photos, No Politics, um, and Baltimore History, and then. Uh, for the schools, the Baltimore Schools Architecture from 1860 to 1940 um, by Peter Kurtz and Marsha Miller with the Maryland Historic Trust. And then again, thanks to my friend Jerome Gray uh, for the wonderful watercolors. And he's JCG Art on Instagram. And I hope you'll go visit him and like him because he is incredibly talented and also a wonderful person. So any questions? Thanks, Meg. We have we have time for maybe a, a, a couple questions here. Um, one question, uh, someone was wondering if the buildings you showed are landmarks. Some of them are, some of them aren't. It yes. just, it really sort of depends. Um, you know, so, uh, yeah, some of them are, some of them aren't. That's all I can tell you. And uh, another question we have here is that uh, Baltimore seems to have a lot of pumping stations. Uh, was this typical of many US cities or is Baltimore exceptional in that fact? I actually haven't really looked into it. I was very surprised at the number of pumping stations we do have. And I actually didn't even really show all of them. Um, you know, I think getting water to a city of this size, uh, you know, is, a very difficult thing. If you think about New York and some of the, you know, roof lines of those buildings, they're all, you know, they all have individual water towers on them. We really don't have that here. So it was more of a municipal thing than a building kind of thing. So I don't really know, but um, you'll just see them, you know, you'll just notice these little buildings. And, and as I said, I was surprised how many turned out to be water pumping stations. Yeah, and also um, Baltimore provides water for the region too. Yeah. The county is lease out, lease that out. 
Um, someone was asking if there would ever be a, a bus trip by BAF. Possibly, we can possibly do that at some point. I think coming out of the pandemic um, could be a good idea to do a bus tour sometime. Well, and also we have doors open in the fall that, um, you know, some of these buildings will be on that. Um, so keep an eye out for that. So subscribe to the Facebook page, um, to the Instagram page, Doors Open Baltimore, and you'll see a lot of information about many of these buildings. And we're in the middle of planning that right now. That's right. We, we're planning on announcing uh, programs for Doors Open in August. So uh, more to come on that. And uh, someone uh, suggested here, Nora, uh, about the uh, City College that the monkey and owl might represent curiosity and wisdom. Oh, Nora, you're so smart. Nora's a friend. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see if there's any any other questions here. Um, well, I'm not. Oh, here's here's one more question. Uh, then we'll we'll wrap up here. Uh, it says, uh, do the sea monsters on the customs building serve the same function as the gargoyles on French cathedrals, um, i.e. to drain water off the roof? No, I think they're just decorative. And I think because Baltimore was a port city and, you know, so involved in the sea and the oceans and everything, they just thought sea monsters would be an appropriate thing to put on the building. Okay. And then uh, this, is a, this is a quick last one. Uh, what is the date of your background lithograph? Oh, this is um, maybe 1860s. I can't even remember which pictures. I think it's, I don't know. I think it's 1860s. It's a pretty common picture um, of Baltimore, um, sort of taken from, a, you know, looking, you know, if, if you were actually here to, you know, it was done today, you would probably be up in the top part of the Belvedere Hotel. Um, but I think it's about 1860s. That's what it looks like to me. Somebody might know better. Yeah, I, I'm looking at it. I, I, I feel like I've seen it. I've seen this before, but I can't, I can't, I don't remember exactly what You it. have, it's colorized, it's everything. I just like completely, I put it in black and white and totally grayed it out. So it's actually not a good representation of this picture. Sorry about that. Well, thank you, Meg. I think that's, uh, that's all we have, all the time we have for today. And uh, just a reminder that we are, um, off next Friday, but tune in uh, two weeks from now for a, a presentation on the modernist uh, Church of the Redeemer. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Well, great. And thank you, everybody, for taking the time to join us today. We really appreciate it. And we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.